Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Night Oasis. It is Wednesday, January 26th. It's the last Wednesday of the month. Can you imagine that? It's already January's over. February's coming. Valentine's Day is on the 14th, you guys. So uh, uh, make sure you're, you're thinking about one another and all of that wonderful stuff uh, that comes along with that. Um, Hey, just a couple of quick reminders on the 13th of Sunday, um, we will be having a memorial service for, for Oral Cravens at, at, the, uh, at the church there, and that will begin at 1230. So if you can be a part of that, that would be awesome to have you there, and we will be having a little food after that, uh, after that uh, memorial service. So you be a part if you can make that. That would be awesome. Um, hey, today we are in part three of the series titled A Better Story. A Better Story. And the idea about this series is that God wants to give us a better story. And, so, uh, and the way he does that is being a, a part of our lives. And so when we put Christ center in our lives, we can't help but have a better story in our lives. Uh, John, open your Bibles to John chapter 4, because that's where we're going to spend some time today. Um, you know, when I think about this uh, idea of having a better story, um, I think about, um, well, when I think about that term, a better story, in my mind, Maybe you're thinking about that and you're thinking, well, um, maybe there was a great movie that you watched that had a great story behind it. Or you might be reading a book that you couldn't put down because it had a great story to it. Uh, when I think of a better story, I'm a Disney fan and I think of Walt Disney. Because if anyone was a master at telling stories, I think he was uh, probably it. And uh, he designed Disneyland and Disney World really uh, around his storytelling ability. And so uh, I think it's what's made the park successful over all of these years. And uh, even though during the pandemic, everybody has their issues, uh, Disneyland is today uh, what it is because of uh, Walt Disney. So I think about that and I know, man, um, Disney had a great story. But I can think of someone who had a better story than Walt Disney, and that's Jesus. I mean, Jesus had a better story that spilled over and affect other people's lives. The, the Bible is full of people who Jesus encountered and he gave them a better story. Last week, we looked at a story about a, a blind man. I love that story. He was blind at birth and Jesus healed him and it completely changed his life. You remember the story from last week. If you missed it, go back and watch that again because it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome story. Today, we're going to look at a story about a lady who was an outcast from her society. She was looked down at uh, by her community, um, and she really, she lacked hope for her life. She was really down, right? Uh, but here we see in the story that she has one encounter with Jesus, and it gave her hope, it gave her purpose, and it gave her life meaning. Well, maybe you're here today, maybe uh, you know, with us online, and you're watching from home, or or wherever it is you might be watching this from, or hearing it on a podcast. However, it is you're getting this, and maybe you're thinking, you know. That's what my life needs is a better story. Yeah, maybe you just found out from the doctor that you have a tough medical issue that you're dealing with. 
And you can't help but think, I need a better story to this. Maybe you just found out that the place that you work is downsizing. And there's a chance that you might be losing your job. And you're thinking, Lord, if I ever needed a better story, I need one right now. Or maybe you're finding yourself in a place where you're dealing with a broken relationship. On Sunday morning, we're talking about the importance of relationships, right? And so we find out that it's really all about relationships in our lives and that there's power in our relationships. So maybe today yours is broken a little bit and you need a better story. So you're going to come Sunday and listen to the message and then you're going to apply some things to your life. But whatever it is you're dealing with, you know that no matter what the experience is, that with Jesus in the center of your situation, your life, it always brings a better story. Um, before we go in any further, I want us to pray as we start tonight. Um, that God would speak to your heart specifically about how you can have a better story by looking at how God gave a better story to a woman who was an outcast. Let's pray. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this night. We pray, Father, as we study your word, that you would guide us, that you would protect us, that you would give us wisdom to know how your word can not only work in the people in the Bible, but work for us today. And so, Lord, uh, give us wisdom concerning our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, how do you give people a better story? Uh, it's the first point in your notes, because we have the opportunity to give a better story to other people. Of course, Jesus is the one who does that, but he wants to use you to give other people a better story. He wants to work through you. The Bible is full of people who received better stories because God worked through people who was led by God. So how do you give people a better story? It's the first point that I want you to write down in a notebook or something or on a notepad. Um, you need to know your purpose. That's number one. You need to know your purpose. So uh, what's, what's your purpose in life? Wow. Let me hit you with the easy questions first, right? What's your purpose in life? I mean, some might say it's to have a good marriage. Some might say it's to raise good kids. Some might say it's to have a successful business. Uh, you may be, or, or you may find yourself um, retired. And you, you say, my purpose is to have enough money to retire on. Uh, and although those are good answers, it's really not your purpose if you're a Christ follower. It's not the reason you were created. You were created to know God and to make him known to everyone else. Um, here's how I say it. My purpose is to go to heaven and to take as many people with me as I can. And that's your purpose too. It's really important for us to understand that. I think I said that in a, in a sermon a while back, that there are people that are dying, many people dying every minute, that do not know Christ. And we like to focus on those that do know him in our minds. But maybe we need to transform a little bit our minds and realize, although we can praise the Lord for those who have accepted him, 
it makes me sorrowful to know that there are some that haven't. You get that? Yeah, here's, a, here's some statistics that I came up with a couple of years ago, and it really hasn't changed much because there are no new statistics on this. But 85% of Americans don't attend church, 85%. And in Arizona, that number is about 90%, which means 10% of the people in Arizona attend church anywhere. Here's something else interesting. 85% of people asked said that um, they would go to church if somebody would invite them. 85% of the people asked said, I'd go if someone invite them. 55% uh, of Christ followers haven't invited someone in the last six months. 55% have not invited anyone to church in the last six months. That's why we see more churches closing than we see opening. Listen to this one. On the average, the average number of Christ followers sharing their faith in the last six months is one. One time. One time in six months. So what's your purpose? Do you understand that God wants you to do what he's calling you to do? Do you understand what he wants you to do? I'm so thankful that so many of you would say that the statistics do not reflect me. I know that that's true because I know that you're not afraid to invite people or to have spiritual conversations. Many of you have them all the time. You and I have them all the time. And I, believe me, when I hear those conversations happening, uh, it brings joy to my heart to see that you're comfortable enough to have those conversations. But here's what you need to know. Um, Jesus always knew his purpose. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus told them, a parable about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, 99 were with him safely, and one sheep wandered off. And the shepherd went after the one that was lost and brought him back. And there was more rejoicing over the one that was lost than had been found um, the, the than the 99 that were already there. Uh, see, our mission is always to find people who are far from God. He was always looking for people so that they could have hope. Isn't that interesting that that was Jesus's plan and that was his role that was his purpose and how we are called to walk like him. We're called on the same mission that he had to bring hope to those who are lost. See, I believe that we can't give people a better story unless we are people who are burdened for people who don't know God. There has to be, there has to be some passion in us to understand that we're not playing church, that what we're doing is trying to lead people to the one who can save their life for eternity. You know, we, we talk about bringing people to church and doing that. And you have to know that, yes, we want people to come to church. We want more and more people to come to church. 
but not so that we can have a big church, but because we believe that in that environment, in that setting, when they come, they could hear what God has to say. They could hear what God has to say. Uh, as many of you know, my, my phones will ring. Everything will happen to try to distract us from, from God's word. And so what I'm going to do now is turn my phone off. So if you're calling me, sorry, I'll be turning it on after the after this time together. So uh, in today's story, we're going to look at an encounter that Jesus had with someone who was far from God. Um, it's in John chapter 4, like I started off. Um, are you there yet? Are you at John chapter 4? Now, I want to encourage you to go back and read the story because uh, I'm not going to read all 40 verses because you would not be too happy with me. Um, but it's good for you to read the entire story, the story from beginning to end. So uh, let me set this up for you. Now, Jesus and his disciples were going from Judea to Galilee, right? Judea to Galilee. On their journey, they had to pass through a place called Samaria, Samaria. And they went through Samaria. They stopped at Jacob's well to get some water. Jesus was tired from the journey, so he sat down by the well. As the disciples went into town to get some food, uh, I don't know if there was a little Caesar's pizza there or whatever they did, but they went to get some food, little Caesar's, right, Caesar. Uh, at this point, it's about noon, right? It's about noon in the day. And that's where we pick up the story. It's Jesus at the well with the disciples going to get some food. John chapter four, verse seven. Oh, when the Samaritan woman came to draw water, this is a Samaritan woman coming to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Now, as we read that, we see that there's a problem. Because the woman would go out to get water um, very early in the morning. They would never go out in the middle of the day when it is the hottest. So they would go either early in the morning or late or on at night. But see, they would never go by themselves because of safety reasons and that type of thing. So here Jesus is, it's midday, it's noon. Samaritan woman is traveling alone and it's in the heat of the day. Now Jesus asked the woman for a drink of water and the problem with that is that Jews do not speak to Samaritans and men do not speak to women. It just wasn't done. It wasn't the right thing to do. It just wasn't. The, the, the Jews of that day would go around the town to not go into Samaria because Samaria was the land of heathens. You know what I'm saying? Kind of like where we live. <laughs> John chapter 4, verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? I mean, the Jews would never associate with the Samaritans, and a man would never talk to a woman, a Jewish man talked to a Samaritan woman. Uh, so J Jesus is now engaging a conversation with a woman over a drink of water. Isn't it funny how our conversations about something that is totally, totally different than God can lead to a conversation a life-changing conversation about God. 
John chapter 9, go to verse 10 now, next, next verse. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it, it is that ask you for a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. You see what's happening? He's relating drinking water to a relationship with living water relationship with Christ she finds this conversation interesting and she says how can I get some of this living water because Jesus says if you get this living water you would never thirst again hey listen if you're a Samaritan woman it's in the heat of the day and you're carrying these big buckets for water because you're going to be there's going to be thirst how do I never thirst again, right? She says, how can I get some of that so I don't have to keep drawing this water all the time? Jesus continues the conversation because he now has this woman's attention. John chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Uh, she says, uh, I have no husband, she replies. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you are now have is not your husband. That's a conversation like my sermons when I go, good night, everybody, when I say something that's not going to go over real well, right? It's something that she's keeping a secret, something that she doesn't want him to know. But he knows, and he's trying to deal with it head on. So the woman realizes that there's, there's something different about Jesus. Because he knows all this stuff about her. She thinks Jesus is a prophet because he knows these things. So she turns the conversation to spiritual things. And... Let's look, verses 19 and 20. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on the mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus begins to tell her that the issue about worship is not where you worship. It is, it's, who you worship, that's the important thing. Not where you're worshiping, but who you worship. Jesus says, listen, if you drink this living water, you will never thirst again. And I know you have been looking for the Messiah. And Jesus has something else to say about that. And here it is. It comes to us in verses 25 and 26. John 4, 25 and 26. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, she says, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declares, I, the one speaking to you, I'm he. In other words, I'm the one you're looking for. I'm the one you want. And about that time, the disciples come back and they see him talking to the woman and they know this is not good. Right? The Bible says that the woman who came for, for drinking water leaves her water jars and leaves the living water and she went back to her community and told everyone about Jesus, who she had met. See, that was Jesus' encounter with this woman at the well, and Jesus knew his purpose, even before it happened. His, his purpose was to know God and to make God known to everyone, and God is calling us to do the same thing. You say, well, how do, how do I do that? And 
And here's the second point in your notes. We need to develop friendships. We need to develop friendships. I, I believe that a lot of people struggle with friendships, especially with non-believers. I know we have trouble with that. Uh, if we're Christians, we have Christian friends. We do, because we have things in common. A survey that was taken said that most Christians who have been Christians for eight years literally have no friendly interaction with non-Christians. It happens because um, when you first become a Christ follower, most of your relationships with people who are non-Christ followers disappear. But in a little while, it begins to change because you start spending time in church, you start spending time sharing with other Christ followers. And I, I get it because most of my interaction with people are Christ followers. People have an opinion why this is. Some people believe that non-Christians don't even want to talk to us. But people think that. But here's what the survey says. Non-Christians think that Christians are against more things than they are for. I'd like to develop a friendship with a Christian. I'd like to learn the Bible from a Christian. I'd like to learn what the Bible says about marriage, finances, relationships. Uh, I'd like them to invite me to their church. Non-Christians know that Christians have something that they need to have to fulfill, to, to fulfill their lives and live a productive life. They know that there's something that they found. But the problem is uh, we are all a little overwhelming at times. And whether we realize it or not, we have the ability to give off an air of righteousness that can be seen sometimes as self-righteousness. Does that make sense? So if we're going to develop relationships, we have to take do the do the first key if we're going to develop friendships. And here it is point A. Make this point A in your notes. We have to be intentional. Now, do we intentionally go out and find those people who need God, or do we separate from non-Christians and only interact to those who believe like we do? It's a question. So let me ask you a question. Where is Jacob's well? This is the story we're talking about. Where is that place that you intentionally interact with people? Jesus had to go through Samaria. So where do you have to go every day? Is it school? Is it work? Is it at the market? Let me tell you, I have some amazing conversations uh, at the market. I'm surprised I'm not banned from Costco because I have the most amazing uh, conversations there. Where is that place that gives you an opportunity to engage with other people? If you're going to reach out to unbelievers, you have to be intentional. We talk about church, and, and I think I said this when I talked about the state of the church, that we look for ways to reach out to people who are not Christ followers. So you see us advertise in this money in the mail thing that comes out. You might hear us on a radio, not a Christian radio station, 
but uh, uh, secular, can I use that word? A, wor a world view radio station, a, one that plays pop music or whatever kind of music, country music, because we are trying to reach the very people who are listening to that, who are looking through that. Maybe for you personally, it's at school or it's at work or it's at the market, like I said. But we have to intentionally go at it to position ourselves to be able to, to reach out to those people. Here's point B. We have to look for people who are in transition and in crisis. How hard is it, do you think it is, for us to find people in our daily lives that are in transition or in crisis? Put yourself in a room with 10 people and you'll find one. Lifeway Research asked the question, what life experience would make an unchurched person open to turning to a church for help? This is this Lifeway Research asked this question. 85% said they would go to church if you would ask me. That's a lot of people. 26 said that they would seek the church for help if they were facing death. And I, I could understand that. I would get that. 25% said that they would seek the church for help if they were losing one they loved. Difficult. Very difficult. 19% said that they would seek the church for help if they were facing health crises. 11% said that they would seek the church for help if they were a, a recognized drug on a drug, have a drug addiction. 10% said that they would, if they were moving into a new area. 9% said if they had a broken relationship. And it goes down further. 7% said, um, they're getting married and they want to be around other married people. 4% said they had children and they want them to learn to pray and to seek God for their lives. 37% says, I'm not going to church for any reason. You know what that says to me? Don't miss that. It says that Two-thirds of people want to go to church, but they won't because people don't ask them or they don't give them an opportunity to talk about it. Look, look at how things are growing around us. People are moving in and they need a new church. People are growing up. Building is going up all over the place. I mean, uh, we, Shirley and I drove by the, a road on a road one day, and I said, uh, when did that building go up? And it was a year. It had been a year, but, you know, you're driving along. You don't pay attention, and all of a sudden, think about the apartments and stuff that has opened up in Prescott Valley in the area. You have to know, but most of those places, by the time they're built, they're full, right? So people need God. They need to find a church, and 85% of them say, I would go if someone would just ask me. Listen, we have an amazing opportunity to reach people who are staggering, and in trouble and who are battling, who need answers for questions. And they don't know where to turn. 
So why doesn't more people come to PVBC on Sunday morning? I think it's because we haven't taken time to develop relationships with them. Uh, I've learned a long time ago that people don't care what you have to say to them until they know you care about them. So who do you know that you can build a bridge with? Who do you know that you can care about and try to help that needs to know Christ? Once you determine those people, then you need to take the next step. It's point number three. You need to determine your approach. How do I do this? Now, I'm, I'm not talking about a sales pitch. See, um, what you have to know is that no one likes to be attacked. No one likes a pushy salesperson. They don't like to feel like someone is trying to put one over on you. So relax because that's not what we're talking about. It, it's easier for you to have a conversation with a non-believer than me. Can you believe that? That the reason why somebody would find Christ would be more likely because you're talking to them than I'm talking to them. You remember, I'm not talking about tricking people. I'm talking about showing people you care in a non-threatening way. Uh, I often go places and I don't like to say what I do or who I am. Now, if Shirley and I are together, uh, very often what happens is uh, she will say, um, while well, my husband is a pastor, and uh, that either gets the conversation going or it chases them the other way. But you'll find that there are many people who have had bad experiences in church. Some people tell me, you know, uh, that's great that you're a pastor. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a believer in God, they'll say. I'm just not a believer in church a place where the people of God go. They're not in favor of that. Does that sound strange to you? And well, the same person will go on to say usually, I've gone to church before, I was really involved at one time, and I got hurt at church. You know, I find sometimes that people who go to church can be hypocritical. Say one thing and do another. Well, you, you all know that this is not a high pressure church that we're a part of. You see, for me, it's more important that you find Christ than to find PVBC. But there's no reason why you shouldn't do both, right? That's the answer to that. Look, uh, what better place is there? I, I want to I say this to you because I want to say it in a way, not as your pastor, but just as a Christ follower. Um, I can, I've got to tell you that PVBC is not a pretty place. We're not fancy. We don't have a lot of programs. We don't, we don't have a lot of that stuff. We meet in a school cafeteria, for goodness sake. But those are aesthetic things. We, we never intend to ever be a country club. But we do want to have a place where people come in and develop relationships, relationships with each other 
and relationships with God. We call our church a family, a church family. And for those of you who have been there at any amount of time, you know it's kind of that way, that that's what we do, that people uh, truly seem to care for one another. Now, hey, uh, if you're new to the church, some people leave because at some point in time when you get comfortable, what happens is it becomes more about what I want than what God offers. And when I don't get what I want, it, it causes me to either leave or to try to cause trouble. And so uh, our people I'm so thankful for because we're not interested in that. We're there for a purpose, to build a relationship with Jesus, to build a relationship with each other, and to reach others for Jesus. That's why we're here. We want to grow in him. And so I, I, I love what some big churches are doing, and I, I want us to be there. I want that to be something in our future, but never at the expense of preaching God's word and having a true worship with him. So people come from all different backgrounds and we know that. And here's what you find sometimes. I've been to churches before and I'm sure you may have too when they're not very friendly. You go in and people are talking to each other maybe or they have these little friendship groups within the church. But for the new person coming in, they don't feel very invited. They don't feel very welcomed and they feel like they're on the outside. So on Sunday morning, when Robin says, say hi to somebody uh, next to you, I, I want you to say hi to somebody next to you but you, I want you to look for people you don't know first. And, and as strange as this sounds, if a person is a first-time visitor, I want them to feel attacked with the welcome by everybody coming over or people coming around them and just truly showing people we care and that we're happy that they're there. And uh, man, if, if, you, if you feel brave enough, even give them a hug if they're, if they're wanting that. But remember, not everybody wants to be hugged. So, yeah, so do the first thing. Uh, make people feel comfortable. And then take the next step. It's point A. Share stories. Be willing to share your God story. You know you have a God story, don't you? It's a story about how God has worked in your life. It's really amazing because, man, I have a we have a we have a million God stories. Shirley and I have a ton of God stories. And you have a, a ton of God stories. I mean, here's the thing that you have to remember, that my God story is not all roses. It didn't start off that way, and, it, and many of my God, story, my, my God stories start off as here was my problem. Here's what I had to walk through. And here's what God did. Now here's the beauty about all of our God stories. Your story is your story. You're not trying to convince anybody on whether it's true or not. You're just sharing your story. And it could be a very powerful thing. 
Now, the question becomes, how is it that you and I can move from a trivial discussion to one that's spiritual? Because many of my discussions uh, start off at uh, picking up a case of water for someone and sticking it in their cart for them. How do you do that? I mean, how do you go from talking about the weather or a sports team to talking about spiritual things? I, I like to ask things like, how do you maintain balance in your life? How do you think our country is moving further away from God or further away or closer to God? What do you think? Let me tell you something. In our country right now, that's a powerful thing. Or did you grow up uh, going to church? I always wonder that. Or let me ask you something. If, if someone messed up, do they still go to heaven, do you think? How does somebody go to heaven? Man, that, you know what? That question gets answered a million different ways. And can I tell you something? It gets answered a million different ways, even by some who say they're Christ followers. Well, this woman in our story, she went for drinking water and she moved to living water. He didn't condemn her. He created curiosity in her. Jesus said, go call your husband. She said, I don't have one. Jesus says, you're right, you had five husbands and the guy you're with now is not even your husband. And he didn't go on to say, you loser. You're immoral. He didn't say any of that. Uh, what did Jesus do? Jesus made it easy on her. He made it easy on her past. She already felt broken. She didn't need to be beaten up. Here's what she needed. She needed her. Hope. Friends, can I tell you that people who feel beaten up don't need another beating. They need to know that there's hope. So Jesus was easy on her past. He gave her hope and he gave her purpose for the future. Man, that's, that's how you go from trivial to spiritual. Don't tell people that they're off target. They know it. Uh, when you turn to spiritual things, people get uncomfortable because they're beginning to feel a change in the air. They're beginning to feel like something is happening, happening in this conversation. Often people try to deflect spiritual conversations by talking about religion. Spiritual conversations and religious conversations are way different. Here's what religious conversations look like. I don't go to church because it's full of a bunch of hypocrites. The only thing the church wants is money. Oh, you're a pastor? I, I get why you're talking to me. Or the Bible, the Bible was written a thousand times thousands of years ago, and uh, tell me why it's relevant to my life today. I mean, how can something that was written thousands of years ago have any meaning to me now unless I'm a history player, person, a historic person? I'm a Christian, but I, need to, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Anybody ever said that to you? My spiritual uh, walk 
is between me and God. Now let me tell you something, if that's you saying that, your spiritual um, relationship is between you and God. And God would tell you that it was never intended for your spiritual walk to be just between you and him. Never, ever. And you're off track if you think religion and a spiritual walk is the same. I always look at religion as a set of rules. And I always look at a spiritual walk as a relationship with Jesus and a relationship with others and a, a time where I can have hope and a purpose in my life. Uh, look at what it says in John 4, 19 through 25. Let's take a look at this. Hang with me here because it's uh, six verses. So hold on. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. You remember that from a minute ago. Our ancestors worship in the mountain, but the Jews claim the place where you must worship is in Jerusalem. The woman just, just the woman, um, I'm sorry, verse 21, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountains nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come. Why has it now come? Because of Jesus, right? When the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worship must be worshiped in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Jesus is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. In other words, you know, we have to just wait for him because we don't get this. We, we know that when he comes, he'll explain everything. And here's the important thing to know, how to talk about the difference between religion and Christianity. And here's the difference. Religion equals the word do. There are many people who believe that if they do a lot of good things, they can work their way to heaven. Like God has some heavenly scale that puts bad things and good things, and when you die, he takes that scale and weighs everything out. And if the good outweighs the bad, you win. Aren't you glad it's not like that? Christianity equals the word done. Jesus has already paid the price by his death on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins so that we can obtain the promise of eternal life with him in heaven. Look, look at what the Bible says in John 3.16. You should know this by heart. I bet that you do. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. See, it's not about saying, look at what I did. It's all about saying, look at what Jesus did for us. It's a gift from God. So we need to understand the difference between religion and Christianity. And after you do that, here's the fourth thing. You need to expect God to work. Man, you know, I, I pray and I hope he does something. No, 
You need to be a person who expects God to work. And sometimes that means you need to be patient and you need to trust God's timing. See, our job is not to close the deal. Our job is to invest and to invite. Our job is to plant and water and trust God to cause the growth and to convict. Then I want you to know that you need to expect God to work, to be, be positive. Understand that when people receive the good news, and that's Jesus is the good news, and that they're saved by grace, that means that we're saved even when we don't deserve it. We get what we don't deserve. We get what we need. When we understand down deep inside that you just can't wait to share with someone else what God is doing. So the woman at the well has been trying to change the subject to religion and Jesus dealt with that by letting the woman finish that discussion by saying something people think is the easy way out. And here's what he says. It's in John 4, 25. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Jesus is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus has something he wants to tell her right now. verse 28 and 29, or verse 26, I'm sorry. Jesus declares, I, the one speaking to you, I'm he, I'm the one. Now I want you to go to verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one that we're waiting for, everybody? Now, this is a woman who is going to the well by herself in the middle of the day because she was an outcast from her society. Nobody wanted to do anything with her. They didn't want to know her. They didn't want to hear from her. And look what happened. John 4.30. They came out of the town and they made their way toward it. You get that. Here's a woman that nobody even wanted to associate with. They didn't even want to talk to. And they, they what they called shunned her. Stay away from me. They, they don't want her for any reason. They felt like she was like an unclean person. Her past was in her past. Her future had now had a hope and a purpose. Now go to 439 John. 439. Many, many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. See, the greatest evidence of the power of God is a changed life. That's why when you share your story about the difference Jesus has made in your life, it will leave uh, it will it will lead others to seek a better story for their own lives and they will begin to realize that the better story that they seek will come when they invite Jesus into their story Let me ask you something. 
When was the last time that you helped someone invite Jesus into their story? I hope you say it was this morning. But the truth of the matter is if you say, I've never done that. Well, today is the rest of your life, the first day to the rest of your life. So I want to invite you to be ready. Be intentional. Because the life that you may be saving may be one that is only with us for a short time. And because of you, they may obtain life within heaven for eternity because you are allowing God to work through you. Let's pray. Well, dear Lord, thank you for this message tonight. I, I hope, Father, that as we um, leave this place or leave this time together, that you would put a burden in our hearts for those who are lost that you would help us to understand that we're not selling anything. We're just sharing that our lives have a better story because Jesus is in the center of it. Help us to know that when we have those conversations, what we're really saying is that you can have a better story in your life if you invite Jesus into it. So thank you now, Lord, for this time, for this message. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, I'll see you Sunday. You're going to love the message, I think. See you then. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.